As much as humans have the capacity to harm our planet, there are countless stories of people who have dedicated their lives to helping restore it to what it once was. Conservation efforts around the world are working to save the species that are most at risk of being lost. In this video, we're taking a look at five species of plant and animal that have been saved from the brink of extinction. Welcome back to All About Nature. On my channel, I try to bring nature-related content that's both educational and entertaining. If you like this kind of content, then please consider liking the video, leaving a comment, or even subscribing to the channel. I really appreciate your support. Snail kites are interesting birds of prey. The females are brown and white, while the males are a beautiful gray-blue color. They also have a conspicuous curved bill, thanks to their unique diet. As their name suggests, these raptors feed almost exclusively on snails, making them molluscivores. They fly slowly over the forests, heads pointed down, looking for snails in the vegetation. The species can be found from Argentina and Uruguay in the south to as far north as the southeastern United States. While in most of their range they have remained common, in the United States, the birds almost disappeared only a few decades ago. In the U.S., snail kites mostly inhabit the marshes and swamplands of Florida, where they feed exclusively on only a few species of apple snail. But after World War II, Florida began to develop rapidly. The Everglades were being converted into new neighborhoods, shopping centers, resorts, and golf courses. In order to build over the swampy land, something needed to be done about the water. The Everglades began to be drained, and as the water disappeared, the apple snails died off. The snail kites struggled to find enough to eat, and their numbers in the United States plummeted. In 1967, they were among the first species to be added to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's endangered species list. Snail kites gained official protection, but it wasn't enough. Despite the Everglades being designated as a national park, and over 20 billion U.S. dollars being poured into habitat restoration, the snails just couldn't recover. So by 2007, there were as few as 800 snail kites left in the United States. Florida is famous for another interesting phenomenon. Due to its warm climate, countless invasive species have managed to establish themselves in the state. Foreign aquarium fish, reptiles, plants, amphibians, and mammals have become common in the Everglades, and most of them have had a seriously negative impact on the environment. In the late 1990s or early 2000s, a new species of apple snail was introduced to Florida. The island apple snail is originally found in South America, but had become popular in the aquarium trade. It was one of the many species that was accidentally introduced by people dumping their aquariums into wild spaces. As the species established itself, it had a further negative effect on the native apple snail species. Being much larger, it was outcompeting them for food. The number of island apple snails exploded. But while the native apple snails were negatively affected, the snail kites made a change in their diet. They began to eat the invasive snails, despite them being much larger. Over the next 15 years, the snail kites recovered from 800 wild birds to over 3,000. The snail kites in Florida also underwent an amazing form of rapid evolution. With their new prey being larger, it was the larger snail kites with the biggest beaks that were the most adept at feeding on the island apple snails. This meant that the largest snail kites were more likely to survive and breed. And as a result, the birds in Florida are physically larger today than they were only a decade ago. There are four extant species of lynx. The Canada lynx, the bobcat, the Eurasian lynx, and the Iberian lynx. The first three species are all listed as least concern, meaning that they have healthy populations in the wild. But just a short time ago, the Iberian lynx almost went extinct. It once lived throughout the Iberian Peninsula, southern France, 
and even all the way down into southern Italy. But over the last few thousand years, the species became limited to modern-day Spain and Portugal. The Iberian lynx is a relatively small cat, only standing about 60 centimeters tall at the shoulder. As a result, they mostly feed on smaller prey. While they'll eat birds, rodents, and young deer, they have a strong preference for eating European rabbits. Unfortunately, they have also been known to eat farmers' livestock, such as sheep and chickens. In the 1950s, the Spanish dictator Francisco Franco passed a law that allowed people to hunt any animal that was deemed to be vermin. The Iberian lynx unfortunately fell into this category, and overhunting began. Despite the species gaining protection in the 1970s, public opinion remained against the species and the hunting continued. But this wasn't the greatest threat to the Iberian lynx. Continued changes in land use meant that less and less of the wild spaces that the species relied on remained. In 1950, the population of Spain stood at 29 million, but by 2000, it was over 40 million. This meant that more and more of the country was developed for human settlement. The lynxes lost 80% of their preferred habitat and became restricted to mountainous regions. To make matters worse, their main prey was suffering. 75% of the diet of the Iberian lynx is comprised of rabbits. Adult lynxes require one rabbit per day, while a female with kittens may need to hunt as many as three rabbits daily. Throughout the 1900s, rabbit populations were hit by outbreaks of diseases like myxomatosis and rabbit hemorrhagic disease. Rabbit populations continually crashed, and the Iberian lynx struggled to hold on. In 1950, there were 15 subpopulations across Spain and Portugal, but by 1990, only two remained. In the year 2000, the species was critically endangered and only an estimated 94 lynxes survived in the wild. Thankfully, people began to work to save them before they were gone. Since 1994, well over 100 million euros have been spent on conservation programs. Natural habitats have been restored. Breeding programs have been established. Rabbit populations have been supplemented and monitored. And unnatural causes of death such as by hunting and road collisions, have been decreased. By 2012, the wild Iberian lynx population had increased from 94 to 326. They were still endangered, but they continued to recover. Through reintroduction programs and natural movement of wild animals, the lynxes managed to spread back into parts of their former range. Today, there are eight subpopulations across the Iberian Peninsula, and in 2024, their population was counted again. Amazingly, the species has surpassed 2,000 wild animals. This led to the IUCN reclassifying them as vulnerable. While the species continues to recover, they're still facing threats. Iberian lynxes are regularly struck by vehicles. In 2023 alone, 144 cases of roadkill were documented accounting for about 7% of the wild population. They also suffer from a lack of genetic diversity, and inbreeding has become a documented problem in some of the new populations. Eight hundred kilometers east of New Zealand's main islands is a group of ten small islands that are known today as the Chatham Islands. They're extremely isolated and only cover about 800 square kilometers. Due to their isolation, no terrestrial mammals ever colonized them, and as a result, birds dominated the landscape. Nesting seabirds were the most abundant, but the islands were also home to rails, ravens, shorebirds, warblers, parakeets, and a small species of black robin. Due to the lack of mammalian predators, many birds on the islands didn't need to rely on flight to be able to survive. Over time, the little black robin also lost some of its flying ability. 
The Chatham Black Robin spends its time in the low-altitude scrub forests, where they feed on insects. In the wild, they generally live for about four years. By the age of two, they're sexually mature, with females laying an average of two eggs in their cup-shaped nests. About 500 years ago, the first people, known as the Moriori, arrived on the Chatham Islands. The islands weren't very hospitable for a large human population. There were very few trees on the islands, and no large prey animals on land. As a result, the Moriori sourced the majority of their food from the ocean, but they also ate the birds. Within only a short time of human arrival, two of the largest bird species on the island, the Chatham Raven and Hawkinson's Rail, were both hunted to extinction. When Europeans arrived on the islands in 1791, things got considerably worse. They brought with them a myriad of new animals over the coming century. Cats, rats, goats, pigs, starlings, cattle, horses, and possums all established themselves on the islands, especially on the two largest islands of Chatham and Pitt. With the introduction of all these new species, the endemic fauna continued to go extinct, with the Chatham Fernbird, Chatham Rail, and Diefenbach's Rail all disappearing by the end of the 19th century. Meanwhile, the Chatham Black Robin also disappeared from the two largest islands. By 1871, it could only be found on Little Mangare Island, which is less than 15 hectares in size. Throughout the 20th century, the population continued to decline, until 1980, when there were only five Chatham Black Robins left, three males and two females. It seemed that hope for the species' recovery was lost. That is, until one man stepped in to help save the birds from extinction. Don Merton was a New Zealand conservationist who cared deeply about preserving the country's biodiversity. He developed a plan to save the Chatham Black Robins. First, all five of the survivors were rounded up, moved to Rangatira Island, and banded, each with a different color. The two females were banded blue and green, and researchers began to call them Old Blue and Old Green. Attempts were made to get them to breed with the remaining males. Old Green would regularly lay eggs and hatch chicks, but sadly none of her offspring would survive past their first year of life. Meanwhile, Old Blue was mating with a male called Old Yellow. While the birds only lived for about four years in the wild, Old Blue managed to live for an impressive 13 years in the breeding program. In total, her and Old Yellow managed to rear 11 chicks to maturity. But Merton wanted to speed up the rate at which they were producing black robins, so he began to do something known as cross-fostering. After the birds laid a clutch of eggs, they were removed from the nest. This led the birds to believe that they had failed at producing offspring, and a second clutch would be laid. Meanwhile, the stolen eggs would be placed in the nests of the similar tomtit, where they would be hatched and raised by their new foster parents. While this doubled the production of chicks, the birds were suffering from another strange problem. The Chatham Black Robins had a maladaptive gene that led to them laying their eggs on the rim of the nest. Fearing that the eggs would fall and break, researchers would push the eggs back in to save them. But the more they did this, the more the maladaptive gene survived in the population, and the birds continued to lay their eggs on the edge of the nest. Fearing that this gene would lead to the eventual demise of the species, the difficult decision was made to stop pushing the eggs back in. Birds that showed this behavior began to fail to breed, and the gene was eventually successfully removed from the population. Thanks to the conservation efforts of Merton and his team, today the population of Chatham Island black robins is up to over 300 birds. With ongoing work on habitat restoration on the Chatham Islands, it's hoped that the species will continue to recover. Today, every single Chatham Island black robin in existence is the direct descendant of Old Blue and Old Yellow. But amazingly, the species shows no negative side effects of inbreeding.
The fen orchid is a small and inconspicuous yellow orchid species found in Europe and North America. It grows in very specific and rare conditions. They can only grow in two types of habitat. One is on clumps of moss that form on peat or sedge tussocks. The other is in wet sand, where the dry sand on the surface is regularly blown away by the wind. They require high calcium and very wet soil in order to grow, and for the seeds to germinate, they require the presence of a mycorrhizal fungus in the soil. In the United Kingdom, the species was limited to only a few areas of bog and sand dunes in Wales and eastern England, but the habitats that they occupy have been heavily altered over the last 200 years. Bogland has been converted for agricultural use, peat digging and mowing has destroyed much of their habitat, and the popularization of spending time at the beach has led to sand dunes being destroyed. By the end of the 20th century, only a few hundred plants remained in the United Kingdom, and they were one of the most endangered plants in Europe. But a growing number of people realized how important bogs and sand dunes were as habitats for rare species. Conservation work across Great Britain sought to restore these habitats back to their former state, and with growing conservation efforts, the fen orchids began to make a comeback. Cambridge University began a program to study the role that the mycorrhizal fungus plays in seed germination. The hope is that as the orchids are introduced to new sites around the country, researchers will be able to ensure that conditions are right for the plants to reproduce naturally. By 2019, a count of wild plants in Wales found 4,000 fen orchids growing in the wild. As of 2024, that number is estimated to be over 15,000 plants across Great Britain. Plant Life, the organization that has been working to monitor the species, hopes that soon the fen orchid will no longer be considered a threatened species in the United Kingdom. The island of Majorca is situated in the Mediterranean Sea, about 200 kilometers east of the Iberian Peninsula. The island was first inhabited by people about four and a half thousand years ago, and upon their arrival, endemic species began to go extinct. At least three species of native mammal went extinct shortly after human arrival. The dwarf goat antelope, the giant dormouse, and a species of shrew. In 1977, a fossil was discovered that added to the list of lost species from the island. It was a small toad. How it had disappeared was unknown, but researchers assumed that the introduction of non-native animals with the arrival of the first people likely led to its demise. About 2,000 years ago, the viperine snake was introduced to Mallorca, and the species is known to feed on small amphibians. But two years after the fossil was discovered, another interesting discovery was made on Mallorca. The island has a mountain range known as the Serra de Tramuntana, and up in a remote mountain stream, researchers came across the mysterious froglets of an unknown species. It didn't take long for them to realize that these were the same toads that had just been described from fossils only two years prior. Wild toads were immediately taken into captivity and studied, and soon it was realized that this was a species of midwife toad. Midwife toads have interesting breeding behaviors. For one, it's the females that fight for a male. When she secures one, she lays a string of eggs on his back, which she then fertilizes. The males will carry the eggs until they're ready to hatch, and the tadpoles are released into streams. In 1979, their population had been limited to this one stream in the mountains. Thankfully, the Mallorcan midwife toad proved to be relatively easy to breed in captivity, and by 1988, researchers were ready to begin reintroducing them to the island. Habitat was restored at several locations, and the reintroductions began. But they still faced a few challenges. Another frog species had been introduced to the island, Perez's frog. Being much larger, they viewed the toads as prey and competed with them for suitable habitat. The viperine snake continued to decimate toad populations, 
in some locations by as much as 90%. And the growing human population and mass tourism of the island has meant that human demand for water has grown astronomically, leading to the draining of potential habitats. To make matters worse, in captivity, the toads contracted several new diseases, including the amphibian chytrid fungus. As the toads were reintroduced to the wild, so were these new infections. Thankfully, over time, the infection rates have seemingly gone down, and the wild Mallorcan midwife toad numbers have increased. Today, an estimated 3,000 mature toads are living in the wild on the island. This has led to the IUCN downgrading the species from critically endangered to vulnerable, making it the only species of amphibian to ever be downgraded. And that's it for today's video. What other species do you know of that have been saved from extinction? Let me know in the comments below. Next week, we'll be looking at five more success stories. If you want to come back for that, make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon for notifications. I'd also like to say a special thanks to my patrons. Without their ongoing support, I wouldn't be able to produce a video like this every week. If you want to join us on Patreon, then hit the link in the video description below. And if you want to watch another video about conservation successes, hit the thumbnail on the screen now. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.